So this next speaker is someone that I've had the honor of knowing several years now. Uh, I'm from San Diego, and so is he. And uh, we started a meetup there years back, and uh, you know, it was maybe two or three of us would show up at a local pizza joint, and we were just excited about this crazy thing called Bitcoin. And uh, in, in those early days, I remember many times I'd sit there by myself. I'd do like a church meeting, right? Once a week, we were meeting to talk about Bitcoin. <laughs> And uh, uh, sometimes people would show up. And one of those early times, one of those people was Mr. Paul Poy. And uh, we got to talking. And, and, and he, he obviously saw the opportunity and he went and started building something. And what amazes me is how he's been able to put together just a, a powerful, um, innovative, and cutting edge team to developed probably one of the arguably the, one, of, one of the easiest Bitcoin wallets on the market now, but also has a business directory, and it's also a technology or a platform that you can do other cool things with. So I won't steal his thunder, he'll touch a little bit on that, but he's also going to talk about, uh, as our topic uh, uh, here says, um, uh, edge security. So this is a, a key term that you're hearing, hearing a lot more about. So let's welcome up Mr. Paul Point from Airbits. Thank you. So my name is Paul Poy. I'm CEO and co-founder of Airbits, and we are, as Stephen had said, we are a mobile platform for Bitcoin. It's a Bitcoin wallet on iOS and Android, as well as a development platform to help people secure data at the edges on people's devices. What I'm going to talk to you guys about today is kind of less about what Bitcoin can do or what it has been doing, but what it's motivated, how it's changed our minds and thought processes with respect to security. How it's motivated, what I call a new paradigm in digital security. But let's first talk about what is the current paradigm of digital security. So we've built digital security around an enterprise model where we take all of our data, we stick it on a server that's globally accessible on the internet. Bad idea, as you can see. So globally accessible internet servers to hold our data, and you have a tremendous amount of points of failure. You can attack the network, you can attack any of the nodes that get to your data, and you can attack the actual servers that hold the data. And you also have to trust the people that operate those centralized servers. So history, time and time again, has proven that this model is effectively broken. And news articles come out over and over again about the hacks that occur. Even some of the largest, most well, quote unquote, funded institutions, JP Morgan, They've gotten hacked. And it happens over and over again. App Apple iCloud has been hacked. Microsoft has been hacked. Obviously, in the Bitcoin space, exchanges have been hacked. Bitfinex, Mt. Gox, need not be said. Home Depot, credit cards stolen. All of these use the enterprise security model. And there's just simply too much incentive to hack those servers because you get into one system and you get a massive treasure trove of data and value. And so they're not avoidable. So what can we effectively do? <clears throat> So the answer is what we call edge security. Take the data, take the value, and as opposed to putting it in centralized authorities, keep it at the edges where people actually have to access it or where people or devices or small businesses generate that data. And instead of relying on central servers to secure it, instead of putting data inside of a castle and building a giant 12-foot thick wall around it, but at the same time, putting up this massive flag saying, here's where all the value is. Come get me. Instead, keep it out in the fringes, where number one, each of the devices that you would attack don't necessarily have that one big trove of data. It's just an individual's worth of value. And then second, you may not even know where the value is. You have to go after many, many different devices to get any specific value you're looking for. So it's harder to hack, and there's less of a reward to hack that device. And I'll talk a little bit of, as well about some of the technology used for hacking or how the infrastructure is played out. So with central servers that you put on the internet, you need to have incoming connections. We connect to Google, Google Drive, to Dropbox, you name it. But those servers have to have incoming connections. Your personal device, most of the time, for some people, 100% of the time, does not accept incoming connections. It only makes outgoing connections making it inherently easier to secure. Internet accessible servers incoming all the time. It's similar to that castle 
analogy. You build this massive castle, you put all the value in it, and you've got a 12 foot thick concrete wall, but you've got to lower the drawbridge. You've got to let the right people in, but somehow not let the wrong people in. And that's a huge challenge. <clears throat> in addition to building the great technology, the big thick wall to try to secure your data, there's also the human element. <clears throat> and in centralized storage and with companies hosting your data, you effectively have to trust all the people in those big IT departments to not compromise that data. <clears throat> in contrast, the edge secure model where data is secured on the device, you kind of have to trust yourself and arguably the much, much smaller number of people that have access to that one device. So putting together technology and the human element, the beauty of securing things at the edges, securing data at the edges, gives you not just security by technology, but security by game theory because the incentive isn't there for the humans to get access to the data. <clears throat> so why was this motivated by Bitcoin? Well, Bitcoin was the first time that data equaled money. We've never had that before. Before we had data, and it was valuable to us, and the thing is it was shareable. If I had a photo that I really valued and someone took it, well, they had it as well. They had an article that I wrote and they took it, well, I had it as well. Well, now, if someone takes this data, this 40 character long string, sometimes longer, sometimes shorter, they took it, the value that's hidden in that data is no longer mine. So now the impetus of digital security becomes super paramount in ways that it's never been before. That's been the motivation. And so what effectively has happened is companies have come across the Bitcoin ecosystem and built technology that improves and changes that security paradigm. And they've helped secure data at the edges. So what's the problem, though? What's the problem with securing data at the edges? Is that, well, we have IT departments securing data on central servers, but they're trained, they're technical, they're professionals. This is all they do. And they're used to a lot of the key technologies that are key to securing data, most of which I list here. So encryption, very key to securing data. Backing up the data in case the data gets corrupted, lost. Um, synchronization, keeping it in multiple places and accessible in multiple places. Um, revision control, data rollback, you have whole IT departments dealing with that on a regular basis. Um, password recovery, uh, if the encryption data, encrypted data is, is uh, encrypted with a password. Two-factor authentication, a lot of people for a long time haven't used a lot of these technologies or they were just too intimidating. So that's been the problem with how come end users couldn't handle that security. Well, the beauty of the motivation of Bitcoin is now we're forced to do it. We're forced to actually go down the path and learn some of these technologies and incorporate them into our digital lives. <clears throat> and effectively, Bitcoin wallets are technology that implement some aspects of edge security. And different wallets and different solutions implement different pieces of it. So you have some hardware companies like KeepKey, Trezor, Ledger Wallet that keep keys on a secure hardware device. And then you've got companies like our company, Airbits and Blockchain, which do encryption, backing up, and and synchronizing it onto different devices and some wallets that have you write down 24 word passphrases which are deterministic, which secure your keys once they're off the device. Um, and many different options. There's multi-sig options because with Bitcoin you can secure funds using multiple keys. So GEM and Copay implement some multi-sig options. So there's many different ways that you can secure data depending on what kind of the data it is. But for Bitcoin, these are some of the ways that these companies secure data at the edges. And there's other security tools outside of the Bitcoin space, and these are gaining more and more traction thanks to Bitcoin, because we're seeing the value of securing data at the edges. So Authy, uh, BitLocker encryption tools such as BitLocker, uh, synchronization tools, encrypted synchronization tools such as BitTorrent Sync, uh, SpiderOak, which is a backup service. And I'm hearing people say that they take their keys, they encrypt it, and they back it up with SpiderOak. Before then, they never did any of that. They were just like, oh, okay, well, I just kind of save my data and stick it on Google Drive. You know, an iCloud keychain is actually, even though it's closed source and it's entirely just by Apple, it implements an aspect of edge security. It takes your passwords and some keys for authentication. It holds them encrypted and it backs it up. <clears throat> so what can we do now that we've taken this model of edge security or pieces of it and we've motiv motivated people to use it and taught people to use it? Well, one of the most exciting technologies that I'm really going to be pushing, and I think many different companies will start pushing that, is public-private key authentication. So BitID is one protocol that implements public-private key authentication. So what exactly is this? It's 
technology that can finally eliminate usernames and passwords. The same technology that Bitcoin is built on with public and private keys allows a user with a private key to sign a transaction just the way you sign a check with a bank. But it's digital and it's pretty much unfraudulable, if that's even a word. Can't, fraudulent, can't cause a fraudulent transaction. But you sign a check and that signature proves that you own that account. The public key sits on the Bitcoin network, and that's how people can verify your signature. In the same sense, you can put a public key on a server that you would normally authenticate with with your username and password. And the way that you prove that you are who you are, the way you prove that you authenticate with the server is you sign a message with that private key. And the beauty of this, well, why, why bother with all of this? Well, the beauty of it is today everyone here, I'm sure, has minimum five, if not 10, if not 50 different accounts with many different websites. And you're, what are you asked to do? Create a different password, make it long, make it complex. The human brain can't handle it. So what do we do? We reuse the same thing over and over again. And if you hack one website and you're able to get a list of passwords from all the users, you just take those passwords and you try to pop them into a whole bunch of other websites that you don't even have to hack. You just enter them. The beauty of public-private key cryptography is you never give your password. You simply sign a transaction with a private key. In a conventional website, the private key is your password, and it sits both in your head and it sits on the website. In this model, you only give the public address or the public key to the website. So if you compromise a website, what do you get? You get a whole bunch of public keys. Well, they're called public for a reason. It's OK. But why haven't we been using this? This technology has been around for easily 20 years. And IT administrators use this almost exclusively today to connect and authenticate with very sensitive servers on the internet. But why haven't we been using it? Well, it's because the average user doesn't know how to edge secure a private key. We have never been given a private key that we had to secure. We've never had to look at this 40 character long scary number and said, make sure it's encrypted so no one gets it. Make sure it's backed up. <clears throat> And if you want to access it from multiple devices, synchronize it from multiple devices. But once again, this is what Bitcoin's given us. Bitcoin's given us the motivation to deal with private keys. And so now we can use them for other purposes. And I'm confident this is going to come down the pipe pretty quickly and help really ease our authenticating world, our world of authenticating with websites, but at the same time also make it more secure. And that's a rarity. It's rare to get something that's more secure and easier to use. But this is one piece of the puzzle. <clears throat> what else can we do? Secure messaging. So how many people have heard of PGP? Good handful. So it is email encryption, and it uses public-private key cryptography to encrypt emails. You get someone's public key, you encrypt data, and then they can decrypt it with their private key. One of the key reasons why PGP has not gained a lot of traction is because, guess what? People don't know how to handle private key security. They do not encrypt it, back it up, synchronize it, and whatnot. <clears throat> and we've now motivated that with Bitcoin. Awesome. So now we can take PGP or something similar to it and start pushing forward secure messaging, whether it be PGP, Telegram, Tech Secure, Red Phone, or any other similar apps. We now know how to handle, and we've improved the handling of edge security of these keys. Blockchain technology. So You'll notice that most of the companies I'd listed on that site were kind of Bitcoin-related companies, that one page with a bunch of wallets. Because Bitcoin as a currency, most wallets, that's their key focus, is how do we secure it? That's the most important thing. But I've talked to a handful of what you'd call blockchain companies, where Bitcoin is not just a currency. Now it does other things. It secures property on the blockchain. It secures other tokenized assets. And I ask any of them, ask them what they've done for security. And most of them are like, Ugh, we're, by, we're like the security from 2010 Bitcoin. Because they're dealing with a harder problem. They've got a different business model. Their model isn't security. But now a lot of the companies in the space in Bitcoin can apply some of the security models that they've built and help secure the future of blockchain technology. <clears throat> and then if we build that security and that model and that thought process just for general data, like I talked about um, BitTorrent Sync, which allows you to encrypt and synchronize data, and Spider Oak, which backs up your data. If we build the technology also just for general data, not just private keys, what else can we do with that? 
Well, now we can take other applications, such as like devices, Internet of Things. These devices generate potentially very valuable data <clears throat> and are controlled by communications with them, so that's effectively valuable data, the control data. And we can secure that using edge security as well. I think about this Nest that we have in our office. It's kind of a fancy $200 thermostat. And in the process of using it, I saw the interface. I'm like, log into this website. Great. Uh, set what temperatures you want at different times of the day. And I asked myself, what happened if someone hacks that website? They would effectively have control of, well, depending on how big Nest is, but millions of thermostats around the world. That's the enterprise security model, the wrong model. Nest has an app that I run on my phone, and I can actually change the temperature and the schedule and whatnot. How simple would it be if that simple settings file was a small file on my phone? And for me to change the settings, it simply got encrypted, it got shoved up to the cloud, and then synchronized with my device. And then the device also had a key that could decrypt it. And now, no man in the middle attack, no hack of the servers could actually get access to the settings of my Nest. Now, that, you know, it's not maybe that big of a deal to get access to someone's temperature information. But if that IoT device is now controlling maybe the temperature of a hospital, that might become a much more important thing. <clears throat> Financial applications, QuickBooks, Quicken, uh, point of sale systems, all of them hold financial information, which to a lot of businesses is fairly sensitive. And you know, as the world moves towards the cloud and we start doing cloud computing and web-based applications, we are now moving that information that was sitting on our computer onto the cloud where we're trusting huge IT departments and large companies with that information. It used to sit as a file on our computer, but once again, we never really knew how to encrypt it, back it up, synchronize it. <clears throat> but with some better technology and better incentive, we now have that capability and we can apply it to that space. And same with healthcare records, information management. We put a ton of our information on the web, but completely in the clear. But now we've got motivation and tools to help keep that private. <clears throat> so what have we built at Airbits, and how does that kind of address the edge security problem? So our mobile app is actually built on a platform that we've been building from day one, which provides a lot of the key components of edge security. Um, all the stuff that I listed that most people have trouble with, we do underneath the covers, basically under the hood and hidden from users. So as a platform, you can develop an app and save data on a device that's automatically encrypted. You don't have to deal with cryptography. And then it's automatically backed up onto a peer-to-peer -peer network and then automatically synchronized into other devices that the users might own and are authenticated to. And it includes revision control and rollback. So in case that, uh, that data happened to get corrupted or had an incorrect edit to the data, then you can roll it back. Um, it actually incorporates an aspect of password recovery of encrypted data, which is fairly unique and rare in the space, um, as well as two-factor authentication. We call it one-touch, which is fairly invisible. You enable it and forget it. You don't need a third-party application like Authy or Google Authenticator. All of that built onto the platform that other devs could use. And so what people do know us for is just our mobile app for Bitcoin. So it's a wallet. And that incorporates all of the technology under the hood across two different platforms. And it's built to feel like what we're accustomed to. We're accustomed to you know, username and password, but hopefully the, one of the few ones you'll have to know because it can hold your other credentials. You know, Username, password, and everything is encrypted. It's backed up and it's synchronized across your different devices. And as a company, we see none of the data. We have no ability to decrypt the data, no ability to see it. Um, nobody will spend funds with respect to Bitcoin and other digital currencies. <clears throat> and so that's it. I hope that the insight that I've given is that Bitcoin is amazing for multiple reasons. It's not just what, it's brought, what it has brought to us financially, distributed ledger technology, blah, 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 but how it's made us rethink problems, how it's changed that paradigm. And the analogy I didn't mention to this entire space is that Bitcoin is kind of the, well, let's see, edge security is to traditional enterprise data as Bitcoin is to banks, right? We entrusted banks with our value, and Bitcoin allowed us to actually hold the value at the edges. But at the same time, it motivated this new paradigm shift where, okay, well, our data has been entrusted to centralized servers for a long time. But with Bitcoin, like, hey, wait, wait a minute, we can actually move away from that, at least with some business models. It doesn't work for everything. But let's at least ask ourselves the hard question, what types of applications can it work with? Well, now we have an option. Cool. Thanks very much.
I'm going to be taking Steve's spot. And any questions? I can bring the mic to you. I just have a quick question. What What is the recovery method? Is it a seed with a deterministic set of passwords or, uh, I'm sorry, keys or? So the recovery method is something that we try to build that's familiar to people. So we've got two recovery methods, one that's shipped and then one that we're in process of developing. And one, our first one that's shipped is effectively a handful of Q&A questions. So you set them up, what questions do you want? and then you go ahead and answer them. So it does require a high level of entropy because this is an encryption key. And the answers are, are strongly hashed, and then they turn into another encryption key to decrypt your data and to authenticate with the server that holds the data. Um, but that's what we call kind of recovery 1.0. And then 2.0 will be a split key method where part of a key is stored on a server, and then the other half of the key is stored on your device or emailed to yourself or stored in, I in iOS keychain or backed up on your Google phone. But the key is that, well, not to use the pun, but the key is that you need two keys to, to unlock your data. And those two don't come together in any one place. So you authenticate with the server with a smaller number of questions and answers that don't need as much entropy because they can be rate limited. A server can say, oh, you got the answer wrong, go wait five minutes. They can say things like that. Whereas you can't say that to encryption. So our first implementation is pure encryption with the answers to questions. Our second limitation will be a split key um, technique where you save that key on the device in email and whatnot. But we'll try to, as much as possible to keep that fairly well hidden from the user. To them, it's just recover my password, and then you get asked a few questions. Paul, Steven Sprague from Rivets. Um, fantastic, right? The, the fact that we now have keys from a Bitcoin perspective, the application of it to a much broader enterprise security context, um, even if consumer-centric, can you tell us a little bit what you would see as the difference between what you do and you know, somebody like Good Technology who's out there has deployed basically that suite of capabilities for five or six years now in, in the context of enterprise mobile device management using the same mechanism for key protection that you're using within AirBits? Yeah, I actually did use uh, Good Tech's RoboForm and another sync backup tool and whatnot. And... One of the key things is that, number one, it's a platform that's mobile-friendly across iOS, Android, Windows, Linux, Mac, you name it. And it gives fairly, it, I don't remember good tech, at least the time that I use it, giving you any option for password recovery if you lost the password of encryption. Um, a fast pin-based login, which I didn't mention, is an option as well. So if you're on the same device that you authenticated before, you don't have to keep entering your password over and over and over again. You can do pin-based login. Um, I don't remember if it had revision or control and rollback. It may have, but that one, that one I don't recall exactly. Um, but the main thing is that we were looking for um, what, what was out there that kind of did the full complete suite as a platform for developers and hadn't found anything, especially one that was mobile friendly, like a work across mobile devices and desktop devices. But like, a, you know, there's many, I didn't mention um, good tech, but I think uh, BitTorrent Sync is similar. So there's many point solutions. And so this isn't a space that's empty. And what was kind of the gist of our talk is the fact that people are now more aware and people are using this technology. That's what's exciting. So the question was, uh, is there any talk about lengthening of the keys? Now, it depends on which keys you're referring to. Um, the private keys, so the public and private keys using elliptic curve cryptography, the ones that are used for Bitcoin, to the best of most cryptographers that I know, those keys are plenty long enough. They're very, very plenty long enough. Um, RSA keys, however, have been almost growing on a you know, several year basis, but elliptic curves so, you know, basically gives you more protection where, with a much, much smaller key length. Um, hey, Paul. Chris Groshon. Hey, Chris. Coinstructive. Um, I was wondering, if you're sending uh, encrypted data back and forth between devices, how does that affect the user experience? Is, it, uh, is, there, a time, is there a timing issue? Or? So it does require some horsepower on these devices, so encryption is not free. Luckily, the thing that costs a lot of energy in most um, password-based encryption tools is the hashing of the password. That's, what's actually, that's what actually takes a long time. But that's something you do once when you kind of log in 
right? After that, decryption using kind of the standard encryption today is AES-256. That encryption is actually quite fast. That encryption and decryption is both fast, and in some devices, it's hardware accelerated. Um, but it still is a cost, and one of the costs is also search. It's, it's hard to, at least currently, with current encryption, to search encrypted data. So there definitely is a cost in that. Um, there are some technologies coming down the pipe, homomorphic encryption, that will allow you to search to some degree encrypted data. And of course, we're looking actively at that as the, the platform grows and as encryption and that technology starts to evolve. But there definitely is a cost. You no, know, there's a performance cost. So it's a matter of what data are you storing, how big is the data, how much you have to search through the data, how big is it growing. Um, it works well for, I think, financial transactions on a personal level. The nice thing is this is not an enterprise model. This is an edge model. And so the enterprises have to store massive, massive, massive amounts of data. And you do the processing at the enterprise. You don't do the processing at the edge. At the edges, you're storing you know, kind of an individual's data or a small business's data. And so the amount of processing that you're doing is far, far less. But you're right, it's more expensive. But hopefully that balances out. Earlier you, oh, you, earlier you were talking about uh, having a username password type of thing. Now is there, the, the reason I'm, I'm curious is because the level of entropy required to you know, be able to not be duplicated by somebody else that's trying to enter the same information. Do, is there, how do you make sure that only one uh, are these usernames stored centrally, or are those stored on the devices as well? And and uh, the questions are there ways to make it even more uh, randomized, basically. Got it. So the question was, where are these usernames stored? How do you prevent the collisions? I believe of usernames, since there's not that much entropy in a username, and then. And then the questions, you know, how random are they? So the storage of the usernames is central. There is a central server component to our model. And once again, there may be other edge security models that eliminate that. There's a central server component to that. So the user, that's mainly so that we can detect username collisions. That's really it. A lot of the storage of the data is actually held on peer-to-peer -peer servers, which at this point we control. But uh, we could evolve the platform with a bit more consensus on the client side to enable untrusted parties to hold the encrypted data as well. Um, but the, to, to answer also the uh, password recovery and the questions and answers, there's a list of questions that we, we choose, and we hope that they're high entropy questions, meaning that the answers aren't easily guessable. Um, and we do require quite a handful of them, six of them, and require the answers to be of a certain length. So arguably to some people, their lives don't fit those questions very well. And so that's why we're, we're in development of what we call password recovery 2.0, where it's a split key method. And so you can't just brute force these answers. You know, a, a server component can rate limit you. And so the answers can have much lower entropy. Plus, you still need this key that gets saved on your device. So uh, we're excited about that, that 2.0 mo model of password recovery, but it's not there yet. <laughs>